Esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen of the virtual world, good afternoon and a very, very warm welcome to this t and &E 30th anniversary event. Yes, Europe's leading NGO campaigning for cleaner transport is celebrating this milestone with a fabulous smorgasbord of guests who are going to share with me in the next hour and 40 minutes their ideas, their expertise and of course some concrete examples of what a green recovery for transport could look like. And not just that, but of course what role the mobility system should play in increasing EU climate ambition. My name is Katrina Sickle, I'm a broadcaster and a moderator, and I'm joining you live from the EU district in Brussels in a studio and seated next to me I have the very lovely chief executive or the executive director, sorry I think I elevated him to a higher status, the executive director of T&E, William Todd. Now the rest of our guests are going to be joining us online, we're very very privileged to have two very splendid opening guests and they are of course the EU Commission Vice President Franz Timmermans and also Spain's Vice President and Minister of Ecological Transition Teresa Ribera and they're going to set the scene from the EU and the member state perspective. We were due to be joined by Volkswagen indeed by Dr Thomas Steig who is the general representative of the VW Group and he's the head of public affairs but they really did have a last minute software problem. And I do not jest, but he has sent in a very, very lovely message, and I'm personally sorry that he can't feature in this opening lineup. After that, of course, we have a fabulous panel discussion with uh, three further speak uh, stakeholders who can give us a diversity of perspectives and drill down into the details. And more on how you can interact with them later. I'm not going to dwell on that now, but how you can interact in general, of course. If you want to say something terribly erudite, send it into the Twitter sphere, hashtag TE30 years. So that's that, all very clear. William, welcome. It's great to be here. It's great to be here. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions, but you're going to see me occasionally check in with our audience just so they don't feel that we're leaving them totally alone there. Um, 30 years, it is a proper milestone. It's quite a lot younger than my good self. Uh, T&E is young. But for an organisation, it's, it's had three very robust decades of helping the EU to um, shape some important environmental laws. Is there a couple of achievements that you could share with me and with us? Look, there's a, a lot of things that I'm super proud of, but you know, I'm not going to give you a long list of you know, policy achievements. I'm, I'm just going to give you two examples. And the first one is that when we started 30 years ago, the, the whole idea of trying to solve the transport emissions problem at the source, at European level, that was a completely novel idea. The idea that we would have car CO2 standards, that we would have emission standards mm -hmm. to solve the pollution problem, that didn't exist at the time. But I think we've come a long way right now. CO2 standards, the emission standards, they're the centerpiece of the EU's green transport policy. Mm -hmm. So that's an achievement that I'm very proud of. The second thing that I'm proud of is that Europe is leading the world in transport pricing. If you look at, you know, we have good fuel taxes, we have a carbon price on EU flights. We're going to soon have carbon pricing on shipping. We've got truck tolls. I think, you know, I, think, I think that's something to be proud of as well. But the truth is also that we need to be humble because whilst we have done some good things, uh, 30 years on, transport has become Europe's biggest climate problem. It's still mm -hmm. responsible for unacceptably high levels of pollution in our cities. So we have got to do better. But I, you know, I think we can do a lot better and I think the Green Deal is, is, is really a tremendous opportunity. Thank you and, and, and that's a nice word I think, humility, probably a good driver because a good driver for what's coming next which leads me now to, to my next question which is of course a little bit into the future because 30 is the magic number, let's, let's look at 2030 now. Rapidly changing world, you know this, the pandemic, the climate crisis, we've got recovery post-Covid so I just in a few words, how can T and E specifically contribute to building this greener, this safer Europe in the next decade? Look, I think let's start with the basics. You know, our principle is that mobility is a good thing, but pollution is a problem. So it is our job, our job as, as NGOs, our job as regulators, to make it as easy as possible for people to travel around without causing emissions or env environmental impacts. So that's what we've got to do. We know how to do that in cities. We have walking, cycling, public transport, shared electric vehicles. We can satisfy 100% of our sort of 
mobility needs in cities right now in a, in, in a clean manner. But most people are not living in inner cities. Most people are living in the suburbs, they're living in the countryside, in the small towns and cities that make up Europe. So we got to find solutions for those hundreds of millions of people uh, that are not living, that can't take the bus or the bike. Mm -hmm. And I think it's our job to make it as easy and as affordable as possible for them to access clean, zero emission vehicles, be they cars, vans or trucks. And I think, you know, for us, the future, what the future looks like is when you buy your next car, you're going to go to a dealer, you're going to go to a leasing company, and you're not going to go for that electric car because it's the cool choice or it's the green choice. You're going to do that because it's the smart choice. It's the cheaper choice. Or, as, or, or it's the choice. It's the choice, yeah. yeah. This is going to be the default option. And the way we're going to achieve that is by, you know, the main thing we need to do is we need to, yeah, we need to make it easy for customers. And the way we do that is we have the CO2 standards at European level. They force car makers Essentially, they force car makers to sell clean vehicles to their customers. That makes it super easy. It's efficient, it works, the car market is being transformed as we speak, but it's also fair. And that, that's, that's super important because this is a big transformation. So who are we going to place the burden on? Is it you know, normal people, uh, people that have a small income, buy a new car every seven years? Are we going to have the heavy lifting done by the big companies, the companies with big budgets, smart engineers? And you know, the scale to actually make this happen. I think for us the answer is clear and you know, if we get what we want and you know, hopefully the Green Deal will deliver, okay. you know, 100% of vehicles sold in Europe after 2030 are going to be zero emission electric vehicles. That's what we want. And, th and thank you and for, for also bringing up some uh, topics that I hope I'll be able to, to raise with um, the Vice President just shortly, not least this issue of FAIR. Um, and I think probably a lot of people nodding at home when you talk about, you know, it's not just about the people living in cities, but it's also the convenience factor. That's right. And, and that is what, that's, that's the name of the game. It's all about convenience, sadly. Good, but perhaps sadly too. So, planes and ships, um, tell me about that. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you give me an opportunity to talk about planes and ships. They're uh, sometimes referred to as the ugly stepchild of the clean transport transition in our office. Basically, you know, it's two things. One, the main principle is the same thing. We need to make it possible for people to fly and to ship stuff around the, uh, around the globe in a way that is emissions free. So had I said that 10 years ago, you would have laughed me out of the room. Right now we can do that. We can do that because hydrogen, e-fuels, ammonia, they, they enable this. So that's the journey we need to take. Mm -hmm. But the other part of the coin, and that's the big difference with road transport, is that shipping and aviation have a huge pricing problem. Like airlines, they don't pay kerosene tax. You don't have VAT on tickets, you have no or low ticket taxes. The shipping industry, they basically pay no taxes at all. You know, they're registered in the Bahamas or in, in Panama. Uh, and that's, it's unfair and it's inefficient. And we've got to change that. And, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful that the Green Deal is finally going to be a breakthrough on that. Okay, and you say, and just a last question, because I can see that we have the vice president who is waiting and I'd like to, to get stuck in, in, uh, in, in right on time. Um, are you, you sound very optimistic, very focused, very enthused, um, but there's a hell of a lot going on. Um, is this just talk or is this really, I, I come to you, I'm 16, I say, what are you doing about my future? How are you contributing? Is this, is this going to happen? It's, it is going to happen. Honestly, I, I wouldn't be doing this job if I didn't believe we could deliver. And if you look at the technologies that we have today that we didn't have 10 years ago, if you look at the business support we have, if you look at the political constellation that we have today, I've been in this space for, for 10 years. You know, the opportunity that we have right now with the Green Deal is it's really tremendous. And I've, to be honest, I think we can actually achieve as much progress in the next three years as in the last 30. So I'm, I'm super optimistic, yeah. Okay, thank you. And also just from a personal point of view, because you've got, we were just chatting, we've got a one-year-old, so I think, let alone for his future, that's a kind of a, a stimulus for you. Well, that makes it I, personal, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much. And let me just qualify, when I said convenience, not absolutely it should be convenient, but it is, it was, isn't it interesting what a society that we live in, that we need the convenience to push us to do it. But, but we'll park it there for a moment. Thank you so much. Thank you to William for setting the scene. And I say a big hello now to the Vice President, Franz Tim, it's a real, real privilege to have you with us. Thank you. I know you have a busy schedule. I have a few questions. So if I can go just ahead. get stuck in, that would be uh, fabulous. Um, and I'm just going to go straight to it with, with electric cars, because if we talk green recovery for transport, 
Of course, one of the big solutions that the Commission is pushing is electric cars, but of course, just under 10% have a plug. So how are we going to get to that place where it is accessible, picking up on that word convenient for everybody? And when should we be looking at 100% sales? Because we've got Netherlands saying 2030, UK 2035, France and Spain 2040. So tell us a little bit more. I think there's several things we can do from the government side. And uh, first of all, I think we have to increase um, our ambitions in terms of emissions regulation. Uh, that will already um, push uh, manufacturers towards uh, more uh, zero emission vehicles. Secondly, we have to create the right infrastructure in Europe to make sure that we have charging stations everywhere and that we use the uh, renovation wave uh, we will be proposing soon also to make sure that there are charging facilities also in urban areas where it is often more difficult. If you live in a flat, if you live in an apartment building, it's often more difficult to charge your car than if you live in a, an individual house. Uh, so we need to uh, make sure we create that infrastructure. And then, of course, through European regulation, we need to make sure that uh, what you do is the same all across Europe, that we don't get different forms of plugs or different forms of charging um, uh, facilities or different ways of having to pay for it. So we need to create the right environment for um, our citizens to do what they want to do, and that is to move to zero emission uh, transport. They want it. Uh, and I think this is the biggest uh, driver in all of this, is the wish of the population to move in, into that direction. One of the biggest surprises, I, I lived through uh, this, this COVID, uh, this pandemic, is that I would have assumed that not just uh, did uh, people's health and their jobs move to the top of their agenda, but that perhaps the climate crisis would move down uh, on their agenda, but it didn't. Uh, our research shows clearly that there is strong support across the board uh, of a vast majority of Europeans to move towards a, a sustainable and emissions-free society. And do you think, I mean, th this, this issue about affordability that we just said, so you're saying there's the will there, you're saying, you know, what I see is that they they want it. Um, I mean, what, what, tell me a little bit more about your emissions regulation ambitions. What, what can we kind of expect there that's going to be that, that, that real push? What will we see? Well, you will see in, in the years to come that we will increase the requirements in terms of uh, lowering emissions of cars and that the only way to, for uh, manufacturers to comply with that is to have a substantial portion and at the end, of course, 100%, but a substantial portion of their fleets uh, be zero emission. Uh, and, uh, of course, you mentioned the issue of affordability, which is a, a real issue. You know, I have a friend of mine who said, um, I have never pay, paid more than 2,000 or 2,500 euros for a car, uh, and I need that car to get to my job. There is no public transport. I have no other way. And you're now telling me I need to pay 30,000 euros for an electric car. I can't afford that. And I think there's millions of Europeans in this situation. They want to do the right thing, but they just can't afford to do it. So we need to make sure it becomes more affordable. You see in some countries like Norway and increasingly also in the Netherlands, you, you see a second-hand market for electric vehicles uh, coming. But also, if the amounts of cars produced increases, you see now Volkswagen making uh, this move, Renault is making these moves, and other manufacturers as well, the price will be coming down. So. Uh, on all fronts, we have to make sure that uh, emission-free mobility becomes available to all Europeans. And then, of course, there's a mentality change as well. Um, if I, for my grandparents, having a car would, was a dream. They could never afford it. For my father, buying his first car was sort of the measure of his success in society, in, 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 in his life. Uh, for me, having a car was important as well. For my kids... Yeah. Having a car is not important at all. They they want to get from A to B, and they don't care how, as long as it's affordable and comfortable and uh, environmentally um, sound. Uh, just, so just, also, I, I believe mentality is changing. Just to check, just sorry, 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 and sorry to interrupt, but but just sure. to to come back and 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 pull together a couple of things that you said there. You said affordability, yes, and 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 what people want. Can you just touch again on infrastructure? Because I think that's very important. You said it's one of those three areas. You know, everything is about 
as we said, convenience and how the consumer sees things. And there are some tourists, you know, who are just, whoa, you know, you've got a surge of people on the roads. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're actually not able to charge up. So how do you see that? Can, can the two keep pace with each other? Well, there's, we need to look at, at people's transport, uh, transport needs in a modular way. In urban areas, we really have to increase uh, the uh, performance of public transport, emissions-free public transport. We need to make uh, uh, cycling far more available uh, for people, uh, more bicycling, cycling lanes, uh, more accessibility to bicycles. Um, we need to use digitization as a means to uh, to create interaction between these uh, transport forms so that people can use an app on their mobile phone to make sure they get from A to B uh, by train or by uh, by car or by bike, etc. Um, uh, so all of this needs to happen, but especially in the non-urban areas, more rural areas, I think public authorities have a responsibility to create the right um, charging infrastructure where it might not be easily commercially viable to do so. Then I think we should step in so that every European uh, can be assured that when they have an electric car, they can charge it when they need to charge it. Um, uh, and I believe this is something public authorities should be doing. And we will certainly take the initiative uh, at the European level to make that happen. Okay, let me thank you. Let me just pick up on something that, that you touched upon there with this multimodal transport. And, and you, you, you talked there about the responsibilities of local authorities, the needs in those uh, rural areas. And then, of course, this, this issue of how do you get from A to B with, with, with the traveller at the centre in cities. Now, you know, cities have taken a bit of a, bit of a hammering. Transport in cities has taken a bit of a hammering. How do, how do you, with COVID, you know, use is down. We know this. How do you see the future of transport and where the EU specifically should support it in terms of clean mobility options? Well, now that we're, we're going to discuss with member states their recovery plans, I think we have to take a very good look at the needs, long-term needs, of cities who want to be sustainable, zero-emission cities. Uh, this uh, refers to transport, to waste treatment, uh, to building, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and I think um, I think we have to look, be very careful that we don't destroy existing uh, public transport infrastructure because of the short-term effects of the COVID crisis. Uh, some of them in the major cities are struggling because of the lack of demand for months. You imagine how how high the cost has been. So in these recovery plans, I think we should work closely with member states, but not just with the member states themselves, also with local authorities, to make sure uh, we give a, um, a sustainable perspective to their transport systems and help them where it's still necessary to go from emissions tr public transport to zero emissions public transport. I think this is something we need to do in the next 10 years. And if we do that, we will greatly improve the air quality in, in our inner cities. Uh, we will greatly improve the uh, f existing f facilities for our citizens. And, and thus we will create, um, uh, you know, we will create a much better atmosphere in cities. The world is urbanizing at an incredible rate. So we need to make, we need to make sure that livability in inner cities is on the top of our agenda. And, and clean transport is one of the most important elements in this. It also is the best way of fighting congestion in inner cities. Let me take you to two other issues because I'm very conscious of, of, of time here. So thank you. I'm going to come away, come away from that sort of uh, area of questioning and let's get stuck into the ETS if we can and future plans there because the question of course is do they include extension to roads? What would be the risks there in terms of increasing fuel prices? We've already seen how that gets people angry and that could of course chip away at support for the European Green Deal? Um, could do, would they end up competing with CO2 standards? So what are you thinking about there with the ETS and road transport? And well, of course, aviation and maritime. Yeah, I think, I think ETS has been also uh, a surprise uh, success in, in, in the COVID crisis because initially some voices were saying this is the end of ETS or we should stop with it. And then the price went down uh, in, in the beginning. The price came back up and is now higher than before the COVID uh, crisis. So ETS is a proven system and needs to be expanded. 
we need to limit uh, the uh, uh, giving out of, of, of free allowances in the ETS. We need to expand it to other areas, and I would say we need to, to discipline uh, aviation. We need to look at shipping. Uh, both areas are extremely difficult because they are international, and that's always been used as an excuse to do nothing, frankly. So we really need uh, to move in those areas, and I hope we can convince our international partners uh, uh, to, to do that. But on roads, mm, I'm not convinced. Let, let's, let's have a good look at this. I know that some are saying ETS should be applied there as well. I'm not sure that's the best way of decarbonizing road transport. I think, I think our proven track record of um, uh, higher and higher demands in terms of emissions is much more efficient and effective uh, than, than uh, more. Yes, but we're, we're certainly willing to look into this as a possibility. But at this stage, I personally am not convinced this is the right way forward. And let's let's just stick with with there with those two. I, I I you mentioned aviation and maritime. You said you know you need to get this good balance with your international partners because obviously there you know the IMO has a target in mind with the shipping industry. The EU now has another target in mind for 2050. It's complex. But let me just leave maritime for a moment and stick with aviation. Let's let's broaden broaden the conversation and electrofuels. Now they have certain limits. Cost is one of their limits. Um, strong sustainability criteria have to be addressed. So, you know, if, if you are, I mean, let me hear what you think of electrofuels, what would need to come into play alongside? Well, first of all, I think the airline industry should take a long and hard look at itself and at the way it is structured today. It was struggling before the COVID crisis in many areas. Uh, and now I think consumers' behavior has changed and probably uh, for the longer term has changed. So they should take that into account when they make their future plans. Secondly, I believe we should work with them to make sure that they drastically reduce their carbon footprint. We will need aviation, we will need aviation transport, or we need them to move towards other fuel types. Blended fuels, uh, biofuels, synthetic fuels, uh, developments surrounding uh, hydrogen and other uh, um, uh, non-emission uh, fuels look very promising. So I think we really need to work with the industry. Uh, there where electrification might not be the solution uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, using other types of fuels might be a solution or at least a part solution. And I, I, I'm really excited about these possibilities and I look forward to work intensively with the airline industry to move in that direction. And tell me, uh one of the most important things I need to ask before before I lose you, because you recently spoke, um, you spoke out very specifically talking about the European Green Deal's growth strategy as a roadmap out of this crisis, a map to a better future. Those are very big words. And it is your baby that this should be a just transition. That's very much your baby. So how do we manage this in the fairest way? And, and for all of those auto regions, how can we ensure that the just, just transition applies there? Well, you, when you say it's your baby, I immediately think of my, my first grandchild, my grandson, who was born uh, a month ago. And, and when I held him for the first time, I was thinking, am I using my time well enough to, to make this transition happen in a fair way before it's too late? Uh, and that's what's what's driving me. Um, you know, we have a very, very limited amount of time to get this right. The world will be changing. It's not just the climate crisis. It's not just the pandemic. It's also the industrial revolution that's upon us. So we either adapt to that, we either recreate a balance between us and our natural environment uh, that allows for a fair society where we leave no one behind, or um, we leave it to the forces of the market, the forces, international forces that will be unleashed. And then I know for sure you will have a few very, very successful, hyper-rich people, and you will have a lot of people losing out and losing their position and then becoming very angry and looking for solutions that will not be there. So we have this unique opportunity, our generation, to set things on the right track. But I don't think we will get that opportunity soon, again, if we spoil it now. We're mobilizing enormous amounts of funds coming out of this pandemic. 
we cannot mobilize those funds again one, two, three, four, five years into the future. So we better spend the money well now and not throw it away at structures that have no future. That's my biggest worry today, that we, out of panic or lack of plans, start throwing money at industries that have no future. Then we would do a huge disservice to our children and grandchildren, you know, put extra debt on their shoulders without anything to show for ourselves. So that's why we need to make this transformation happen and we need to make it happen now. And the very, very last question picking up on that is, is, is this, um, is it harder or easier with, with, with COVID happening in the context of COVID to make the argument that the environmental and the economic recovery can go hand in hand? Because there are many who are not convinced and say, oh, it can't, you know, economy first. And, and you are clearly in another camp, but is it, is it tougher? Or are you saying from what I understand, actually, Katrina, this, has given us, this context has given us the platform to be able to explain that better and why it is an imperative that we cannot fail? Well, you know, before, before the pandemic, I think the majority of society was convinced that we needed to change our ways uh, to uh, tackle the climate crisis, which is a direct threat to our existence. Some industries were saying, okay, we know we need to do this, let's do it now, let's start. Other industries were saying, yeah, probably we need to do this, but we're doing quite well right now. Let's sit on the fence and wait what happens, and perhaps we might jump on the bandwagon a bit later. Now, what COVID has done is taken that uh, choice away. Mm -hmm. So everybody needs to choose now. Either we're part of the future or we remain in the past. Either we restructure our uh, uh, industries to be future-proof. Either we use the money we have to take us into the future or we remain stuck in the past. So in that sense, COVID has limited the options we have. And now the, the only option I see uh, we have is to use all the means we have to invest in a sustainable future. Thank you. And I think uh, clearly limiting options forces people to be more creative, more innovative, much, much quicker. Well, the, the, so the beauty of this you. is we can oh, do this. I we can do there. this. The beauty of this is we have the technology, we have the public support, we have the international cooperation in principle uh, present to do this. Uh, we have the financial means because we've mobilized them now. I think we would do, we would make a historic mistake and do a huge disservice to next generations if we did not use this opportunity to set our society on a better, different track. Thank you very much. And I think those are very, uh, they are powerful words, historic mistake and a huge disservice, absolutely. So on that note, I thank you very, very much for joining us. It's been a My great pleasure. privilege to have you here and I wish you a very, very good evening. Thank you. And thank I you very much. You come Bye-bye. I'm going to Bye. turn back to you, uh, William, in the studio just momentarily because I, I would like to get to our next uh, speaker because, ladies and gentlemen, we do have Dr. Thomas Steig of Volkswagen. It seems he has been able to join. Anything you were scribbling there, William, that particularly made you pleased to hear? I think it's extremely encouraging. I mean, to hear the Executive Vice President of the European Commission speak like that, that is... You know, that's music to my ears. I think he's exactly right. This is, this is our generation's opportunity to fix this problem once and for all. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. I've, I have terrorized you into being super <coughs> concise, haven't I? Well, I can see it is absolutely delightful. Let me get my questions for you, Dr. Steig, because I was, I was, oh, they're not even there. I was sadly, I'm doing that awful thing, leaving the screen, which is, which is absolutely terrible. So, but I wanted to make sure I didn't ask you something for which you were not prepared, though I could riff on a theme and ask you something very, very different, but I won't put you on the spot like that. So it's delightful to have you. You are, of course, general representative of the VW Group, head of public <coughs> affairs. And I know that you wanted just first to give a message to T&E uh, to mark this 30-year milestone. So let me give you the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Katrina. And uh, I think uh, we, we have not so much time, so I want to be very, uh, very brief. Um, I think we share the same goal, zero emission mobility. The transport sector has to become sustainable and carbon-free by 2050. And for us at Volkswagen Group, it is 
very clear that sustainable mobility in Europe is electric. Electric mobility is truly green and energy efficient and thus uh, the technology of Europe's future mobility. I truly agree with uh, Vice President Franz Timmermans that the European Union needs uh, the right political framework and uh, a consistent strategy to reduce CO2. One core element of this framework must be a functional charging infrastructure in all member states without white spots until 2022. I think charging infrastructure is critical and very crucial. And from Volkswagen's point of view, Europe-wide a floor price of 60 euros per ton CO2 in 2023 is key. And floor price means ETS and non-ETS sectors. Furthermore, an ambitious energy policy is indispensable. In the decade from 2030 to 2040, we should be able to cover our entire demand of electricity with renewables. And finally, the phase out of coal must take place even earlier and should be realized by 2030. It's, uh, it's not good to, to bring electric cars into the market and to drive electric cars with electricity out of coal. So as you can see, there is a long and extensive debate ahead of us. The transformation of mobility in the European Union is a huge challenge. The most important contribution and commitment of the Volkswagen Group is clear. We push e-mobility forward. And I think uh, despite of all ongoing differences, T&E, together with Volkswagen, wants to achieve the goal we shared, zero emission mobility. Thank you very much. I, I, will, I will just pick up on a couple of things that you touched upon there um, while I have you for, for, for about five minutes. Um, yeah. So you, you had a list of, 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 of asks, in a way, what you think is needed for the way forward. So and you talked about a commitment. Um, what are you going to contribute yourself in that regard towards infrastructure uh, and in general? You said the phase out of coal by 2030. So give me just three elements that VW really is committing to. First, because it's our core business, uh, we deliver um, cars, electric cars, uh, cars uh, with uh, with a very new new elements, the ID3 and the ID4, the whole ID family. And, uh, but I think from my point of view, it's very important. Uh, we, we ask for public funding to boost charging infrastructure, but we, we make our own contribution to, to uh, boost uh, charging infrastructure in Europe. Uh, we we have uh, a special company, Ionity, founded by five car makers, and uh, this company, Ionity, um, provides charging stations along major European highways. So, uh, and our own new brand, Ali, provides consumer charging solutions at home. So. Uh, there is a clear commitment to electric mobility and we do our own contributions to achieve the goals. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to skip because I'm, I'm, I've got that awful thing. And I when I spoke with you on the phone, I said I'm, I'm so tight on time. But I suppose I'm, I'm going to cut to the chase and ask you that sort of cheeky, cheeky last question, because we had a chat on the phone and I said asked you that question. You said, look, VW in the past, all of us companies like ours, we just made announcements. And we can't be doing that anymore. And so it is, you know, we do all remember Dieselgate. It's not so far away. You've got this really, really ambitious plan. Um, are you going to really lock this down so that you're supporting t &E, so that you are literally supporting Timmermans when he is proposing all of these more ambitious standards? 
I think uh, Volkswagen is a huge player in the automotive industry. And yes, we we did have the diesel scandal and uh, uh, five years ago. And uh, in the past, uh, not only our industry, but uh, from business and from um, from other areas of society, we remembered a lot of uh, lip services announcements. But now we are in a situation, and I agree very much what Franz Timmermans said. Now, in the next three, four years, we have to act. We need concrete action and no more announcements and uh, lip service. Well, I think, and I think uh, that's what we, and, and, and the public, as, uh, as Franz Timmermans said, that's what the public wants. There is huge public knowledge and support behind that. So I think also the average consumer counts on you for that to absolutely, what do we say, walk the talk, I think is the best way. I thank you. The challenge is a big one. Um, I am glad to see that, that uh, T&E and Volkswagen share that same vision because uh, 30 years ago there was a much bigger division. So on that positive note that we go from division to vision, I thank you very, very much for being able to join us. I didn't think it was possible. And I wish you a very, very good evening, Dr. Steig. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ladies and gentlemen, if I sort of pull strange faces, it's because I don't see the output. So I don't see what you see, ladies and gentlemen, whether you see me or whether you see my speakers. Anything you want to briefly come in there before I turn to my third opening speaker? Look, it, it, it's great to have Volkswagen with us. Um, it was a shame. Yeah, I, I was worried they couldn't make it. We've been, we've been fighting with Volkswagen for 30 years. I, you know, I share uh, Dr. Steak's hope that the next 30 years are going to be different. I, you know, I, I, I applaud the transformation of that company the last five years have been have been spectacular but i also note that he talks about the phase out of coal but he doesn't talk about the phase out of combustion engine vehicles which is their core business i think you know in the next 30 years or in the next three years we're, we're going to have a, a bit of a discussion about that but that's okay so you wish i you wish that i'd poked him a little bit further there that's okay okay so thank you very much for that um Ladies and gentlemen, as I said at the outset, we, we have a really, really fabulous third opening speaker who I have to, to say has slipped out of a very important gathering at the Senate to be with us. So that in itself is tremendous. Uh, so I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome. Please uh, clap nicely in your homes, in your offices to Spain's Vice President and the Minister for Ecological Transition, Teresa Ribera. It's absolutely great to have you with us. I really thank you. I know that you too have, have time issues, but that's okay. Um, I just to remind those of you who, who may not know, uh, when Ms. Ribeiro was director of the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, I think that was from 2014 to 2018, she really did enable the Institute to play a key role in the negotiation of the Paris Climate Agreement and the transition towards sustainable development. And she served as the Spanish Secretary of State for Climate Change and Biodiversity. So there was the responsibility there for environmental and climate <coughs> policies. So you, I don't know how much, um, Teresa Ribera, you heard of, I don't know how many of those speakers, but um, the Commission does want Europe to be more ambitious on climate. Uh, we're looking at these targets for 2030. How, how, how does the Spanish government see that? Do you support that? And whatever the response is, I presume you do. I don't know. You, mm. uh, what's the biggest challenges and opportunities? How do, you, how do you see that panning out over the next 10 years? Of course, we support uh, this uh, proposal coming from the Commission. And in fact, um, we think that it goes very well along with our own priorities and our own views on the role of uh, Europe, European industry, European business, but also European citizens for something that needs to be resilient. And in fact, we were quite, uh, quite a relevant player in the previous um, uh, We've lost you. Hang on a minute, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know. I think possibly the output for you now is me. We've lost Teresa Ribera, but I'm going to hang on just one moment there and see, because I was very set to talk about Spain, which is, of course, a big car producing nation, but it is lagging behind in charging. And I had a whole series of questions 
But let's just wait just a moment. I'm going to see if the technical team are going to give me any update on that. Let's just see. If not, then I will come back to William. Because Spain's got, I mean, let me, let me, let's just have a chat. I mean, Spain does have quite, they are lagging behind in terms of charging. Um, there is also the fact that they're such a big tourist destination. So they've also got all of that at stake in terms of negative climate impact. I mean, in your work and in your member organizations, what can you tell us? And Spain is a hugely important country, of course. It's uh, one, of the, one of the big European nations. It's a, a big manufacturing nation. It's a big tourism dis destination, as you say. So it, it's, in a way, it's a, it's a testing ground for, you know, for, for the green transition. If we, can, we need to be able to, to make it happen also in places like Spain. We need to find solutions also for the, you know, the more remote regions, not just for Madrid, yeah. not just for Barcelona. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. And what is particularly challenging, I think, for Spain is they got this huge automotive industry, major part of their exports, that they need to transition in the next couple of years. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that the, that the current Spanish government has, has recognized that challenge. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to them yeah, announcing their green recovery plan because you know, yeah. there's going to be a lot well, of... Well, this is what we were hoping yeah. that we would hear a little bit. That's exactly, exactly yeah. it. I think we were going to hear, ladies and gentlemen, about the Spanish climate plan. We may, we'll hang on a little bit, but um, Yes, because of course the other thing is, uh, William, is that Spain doesn't have a battery factory. We are about to hear a very positive European story about batteries coming up in the panel in Sweden. But Spain is not there, not a strong focus on EV manufacturing. So that's, that's in itself a challenge. I think that's one. That's you know that's that's one. That's one of the things that we would you know we would hope a green recovery plan in Spain would would address because you know if you've got a huge automotive supply chain in your country, you know and the future is is, is electric, then obviously you know having access to, to to the batteries is is super important. For now, the the battery alliance has been has been you know a French, a Franco-German yeah. thing, a yeah. Swedish thing. So I think there's you know there's a big opportunity for Spain to also play. A role in that. I think that's super important because that's you know that's where a lot of the jobs of the future are going to be. So I suggest at nearly quarter two that we crack on and then if we are we have the great luck of having Teresa Rivera come back with us, we can introduce her towards the end of the panel. Does that sound good? Because you good. are going to be part of this panel, so um, I will make you work a little bit harder. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that we will be able to get back our connection to Spain there, and we will of course keep you posted. So I'm going to take us straight into a panel debate. Now, some of you have already been sending in questions via Slido. You can still do that. And you can still do that till about quarter past six. You just need to. You can see Slido, of course, below your screen. Uh, you could use your phone if you like. It's slido.com. And you type in the event code hashtag TE30 years. Just make sure that your question or comment is short. And if it's a question, to whom it is directed, OK? So we will probably take the top three, possibly four, uh, the most popular or the most relevant, highlighting something that we maybe haven't touched on yet. So we've got a great lineup of guests for you. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to Emma Nerenheim, who is Chief Environmental Officer of Northvolt. And this is, of course, the company that I was just referring to when I spoke with William. Um, we also have Ingmar Stresser, who is State Secretary for Transport for the Berlin Senate Department for the Environment, Transport and Climate Protection, and Joan Graza Peiras. So we do have that Spanish perspective, which is great because we do have him on the panel. He is, of course, Director for Renewable Energy and Electricity Markets at IDAE, which is the Spanish National Energy Agency at the Ministry for Ecological Transition. So welcome to all of them. The only issue is that because our screen is frozen, William, we can't see them. So uh, I shall just speak down the camera. You, um, lady and gentleman, can see us, but I can't see you. So uh, forgive me if I pull a face that isn't quite the one that I meant to pull. Um, there you go, just in the nick of time. So hello to all of you. Uh, do we hello. have everybody? No, are we missing? Still waiting for Ingmar. Still yeah, we are indeed still waiting for Ingmar, but that doesn't matter. The two most important people are here. That's fine. 
So uh, let me start with you, Emma. Let me just say a little bit about you. You are a bit of a whiz, well, your PhD in the area of water and waste recycling in the metal industry. So you've had very leading roles in the research field, professor position in environmental engineering, uh, director of research for the future energy research team at Mar uh, Malardalen University. But at North Vault particularly, you've been responsible for environmental and social compliance and recycling of end of life LIBs. So the reason that we're so delighted to have you here is because of this real European success story. North Vault's ambition to build the greenest battery in the world with minimal carbon footprint and the highest ambitions for recycling. Hold it there a moment. I will just also, in fact, no, I won't because we're waiting for a colleague. Let's park that there. You have to do that smile while I do your bio. Let me crack right in and let you talk now. And of course, the first question I'd like to ask you, given what's come before, is what specifically for you does the green recovery for transport mean? Oh, well, a uh, green recovery for transport, uh, for us, it means, of course, that taking into account what's happening now with COVID, uh, learning that uh, getting the society out of the crisis means that you have to do a uh, lot of investments, you have to uh, make sure that you invest uh, in the right things uh, at the right time, and to make sure that we really boost the, 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 the climate uh, change recovering uh, technologies, making sure that we spend our resources in the right way, and also making sure that we are prepared. I mean, preparation uh, is a large part of making uh, the society more um, resilient towards future crisis uh, and something that we can be sure of is that the climate crisis would be uh, far bigger if we are not acting uh, now and when it comes to the transport sector as such it's of course continuing this trend uh, and this uh, ambition that the european uh, commission is already uh, on the path of uh, together with all the member states together with all the uh, company initiatives to make sure we are uh, building uh, factories, building infrastructure, uh, and, and uh, advancing the, the technologies and the, and the systems uh, to be ready for uh, a fully electrified uh, car fix. And when you said right at the outset that we have to be investing in the right things at the right time, now there is obviously we know that some of the money and the money from the Connecting Europe facility and money that's being um, ring fenced for infrastructure and some of the ambition and where the Commission particularly wants to invest. Is there anything, you know, that you didn't say there where you think that, Katrina, is where the investment for that recovery needs to go? I think that we need to make sure that we sort of look at the entire system so that we are not blindly uh, only focusing on certain areas. Uh, so far, uh, to, to my own experience, there has been some uh, topics that has really been in focus, uh, such as the, the, the cobalt discussion, uh, the, in particular in DRC. Uh, so I would like to broaden the, the perspectives a bit. Um, and also, the second thing I want to bring up when it comes to the system is to really make sure that the infrastructure is in place. Uh, charging stations um, effect, so the power demand, peak power demand is going to be uh, crucial for, for, for the car fleet uh, expansion. I think that most people do not really understand how extensive the growth yeah. of this industry is and the demand on electric vehicles in Europe right now. Well, I think it will help when I give you a chance to tell your story. I think they will be more, but I'm, I'm going to first come to Juan, Juan Graza Peyaras, um, so who is, as I said, at the Spash, Spanish uh, National Energy Agency at the Ministry for Ecological Transition, very much focused on integrated energy and climate plan and the development of legislation on self-consumption. Now, I'm just going to say what also uh, you were in 2015, because it's important to one of the questions I ask you, which is, of course, General Director for Energy and Climate Change at the regional government of the Balearic Islands, where I think your focus was developing the region's strategy, but also obviously the legislation on climate change and energy transition. And there's a great story uh, from there. So, um, first of all, before we get to that, um, tell me, for you, what, what, uh, what does the green recovery mean for you? 
So for us, green recovery is uh, overall is very much about bringing forward some of the strategies, some of the plans, some of the measures we've already been looking at towards 2025, 2030. The fact that we need to kickstart our economy after the COVID crisis is an opportunity, as I was saying, to bring forward some of those measures. And if we look specifically at green transport, sustainable transport, that's really investing in clean air and safer cities and more accessibility and mobility, including public transport. But it also means an opportunity for industry. For example, in Spain, the automotive industry, the car industry, is a very significant part of our GDP. Up to 10% of Spain's GDP is in different sectors of the, of the car manufacturing industry. Being able to move that towards electric mobility, towards sustainable mobility, is the only way to make sure that continues to be a strong part of the Spanish economy in the future. If we obviously continue to only build cars that are going to be phased out by the market, it doesn't make any sense. In the same way, uh, digitalization, for example, is a huge. Uh, it's going to be a huge tool in mobility going forward, for example, solutions in intermobility. So making sure when you have my phone or with a single card, I can move in public transport and car sharing systems and different infrastructure. That is also a job opportunity, a business opportunity, new business models. So green transport is an opportunity to uh, green transport in recovery, an opportunity to bring forward uh, targets, kickstart the economy, create new business models and a more resilient economy. Thank you. I'm just, Thank I, was, you. I don't know what you can see of me if I was just having a squeeze up face because I was really listening. Just can you kindly just check your line because I don't know if it's not clear for others, but it's not coming through super clearly. So you may have to mitigate that by speaking a bit louder and slower next time. But just have a fiddle and see if there's something there while I talk to Ingmar. It's very nice to see you, Ingmar. I'm glad that you could be here. Um, uh, of course, you are State Secretary for Transport for the Berlin Senate Department for the Environment, Transport and Climate Protection. So uh, this gentleman has got a lot of experience in transport and environmental policy, uh, obviously knows t &E well and knows administration uh, because of many years working in state and federal ministries. Lots of consumer roles actually in the past and uh, Director of Global Sustainability Programs at the Mars Food Factory. So very interesting CV. I'm not going to focus on that bit of it. I'm going to focus on the green recovery now and ask in a nutshell also the same question to you. What does it mean for you and for cities? Yes, thank you very much, Katrina. Can you hear me? Can you just answer or yes. is the microphone off? No. Can you Perfect. So thank you very much uh, that I'm uh, invited to join you in this uh, exciting uh, debate. Yes, um, concerning our green recovery, yeah, uh, what's behind there? We have a few goals as a country or as a Bundesland, a county of Berlin, which is we want to be a front runner in the public sector and climate protection. Uh, we are initiating a turnaround in mobility. Uh, we are going to develop uh, the city in a sustainable way uh, with new housing and new transport modes for these larger housing areas uh, and we are uh, also aiming at uh, economic development and jobs and innovation. Uh, our goals as a, uh, as a government uh, or as, as uh, the department for transport in Berlin is that overall goal is we want to achieve a livable city. Uh, we want to transform the public space in the city. We want to support a modal shift towards environmental modes of transport, such as public transport, cycling, walking, uh, but also we want to promote alternative forms of pro pro propulsion, uh, such as electric energy or perhaps later uh, hydrogen, but uh, so far it's uh, e-mobility that we are promoting here, especially for our buses and public transport. Um, in addition, we are keen on aiming Vision Zero. We have too many dead and injured people in transport and uh, we want to lower that towards zero, which is a hard task. Uh, and besides that, of course, we want to improve air quality, we want to reduce noise emissions and uh, overall, uh, despite that, or in, in addition to that, uh, promote our green infrastructure, trees and, and water, uh, a climate-friendly city in which it's uh, nice to live in, a livable city of 
Berlin. Thank you. That's. I hope that's my two minutes for the start. Wow, you're quite lazy then, because it's not really very very many ambitions there, is there? I mean, that was quite a short <laughs> list of quite simple things. So I don't think we'll have you on our panel anymore. Anyway, <laughs> that's a hell of a yeah. Wow, um, that must keep you up at oh. night. I have to say, you know, divisions to achieve something at least. <laughs> It's, uh, it's fabulous. And I, I pick up actually on a, on, a, on a way of segueing back to Emma, if I may, to just get stuck in to, to tell us about this story. Um, Ingmar used the words there, livable city, you know, bringing down, you know, combating air pollution, noise pollution, all of those things, deaths. Now, part of these, part of these gains comes through electric vehicles and you you really are a hell of a company that, that is trying to establish this very strong and competitive battery industry in Europe. So tell us briefly about it and also what you need from EU policymakers so that it doesn't just sort of stay here, but it's a global leader competing with China, Japan, South Korea. Yes, so our ambition has been already from the start with Northrop to take the next step in leveraging on, on the the battery industry uh, to use the advantage of the industrial traditions within Europe combined with uh, Asian technologies and some experts uh, from Japan and Korea and as well as the Silicon Valley spirit. Um, what, what we really, really believe in is to make sure that we take a little bit of a bigger responsibility or hell of a bigger responsibility to be honest. And making sure that we shorten the supply chains, that we have control of what we buy, how we buy it, uh, how we use it, uh, to be uh, responding uh, to the demand of what this industry is really getting into when we uh, accelerate within Europe, what the customers are expecting, which is more transparency. Uh, I heard um, Volkswagen talking about, of course, the diesel gate. Transparency is going to be a must for this industry. And we also believe that Europe and European battery and EV industry is becoming uh, uh, competitive uh, and, and winners in this race because we will differentiate uh, compared to the rest of the world when it comes to what we can declare, how we can declare it, and how not compromising. We are, we are doing this as a battle of climate change, but we're not compromising with the future environmental problems. Okay. And I'm this is what we also ask for from the policymakers. Okay, thank you. Forgive me again, and I can't see whether anyone can see me going <laughs> on the screen, so forgive me there, but I just wanted to pick up, when you say not compromising, and picking up on something you said in your opening, you said, you know, I want to see more around the cobalt discussion, and here you said, uh, shortening supply chains. That's also very impressive because aren't you sourcing nickel cobalt from your next door neighbours? You're not actually having to go further afield. I mean, that's one part of the success story, no? Yeah, I mean, it, when it comes to raw materials uh, strategy, we have a, a couple of key elements there. So one is to really source directly from the mine. And we are not claiming that one or the other country uh, are automatically better in sustainable mining than the other. Uh, we just want to be very, very close to our partners to make sure that we really can ensure that it's a sustainable mining and that we are not moving materials around the globe uh, several times. And, and the second uh, sourcing strategy that we have is that we do a lot of our materials in-house. We call it the vertical integration. And, and then the, the last one is that we really believe in recycling. Recycling of raw materials within Europe, making sure that whatever we buy on the global market will stay within Europe, will be extracted from the batteries that we have used at the end of life and brought back into the loop. Thank you very much. I'm going to come directly and I'm aware, ladies and gentlemen, just to say you know that if you have questions, do put them into Slido or comments, keep them short and do say who they are aimed at. But we will close that Slido incoming questions at 20 past six. And if I'm correct, Ingmar, I think also you need to be gone by half past six. So I'm, I have that. Yeah, it's around there. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm going yes. to, uh, to go into your livable city and enjoy yourself. That's where you're going to go at half past six, I think. <laughs> so, Juan, um, we heard one sort of tip of the iceberg of that success story there. There's something I said a little bit of success story with you. So I'll come at it another way. Um, 
we know you've worked in the government of Baleares with Ibiza and Mallorca. They're, they're obviously major tourist destinations. And of course, you're going to face competition from other uh, destinations. So how do you differentiate what you offer from those on the other side of the Mediterranean? And is there a role that sustainable transport can play in that industry? And I particularly ask you that question because it's very impressive because you were also instrumental in bringing about the climate protection law, banning the registration of new diesel cars from 2025 and from 2035 in the region. So is that, is that something that you think can make you stand out? Well, I think that's, uh, and I'll try and talk a bit uh, slower just to, to make sure that the connection doesn't catch me out. We just so have I a think bit of buzz this on is the one line, example. that's all. So don't speak too fast and a little bit louder. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was trying to say this. I think this is just one example in which uh, sustainable transport contributes to a more competitive economy. We could talk about industry, and that would be another example. Uh, it makes no sense for Spain to compete with other touristic destinations on price. Uh, we need to compete. We are able to compete in, in quality. Um, so sustainability overall and sustainability in, in transport is a, a very good example of quality, whether that means clean cars to move around your destination, uh, clean walkable cities to enjoy as a tourist, or even shuttle buses to protect the natural areas so you can enjoy these areas without uh, cars. I think all of these examples are a seal of quality with which you can compete as a sort of uh, environmentally friendly destination, which is what a lot of Central and Northern European uh, tourists are looking for with some of the, the main markets. Uh, so indeed, I think sustainable transport is a tool for a more competitive economy, including in the tourist sector. And do you think it's also because, I mean, you talked about cleaner cars and shuttle buses and those cleaner, more livable cities that we heard from Ingmar. Do you think it's also because people feel, I want to be seen also to be doing the right thing? That appeals to me, to be choosing no, you know, an area is where... A... No, so so indeed, uh, the image is, is, is a very important part. So uh, we live in a constantly connected world and pretty much all our contacts on social media most of the time know when we're on holiday and, and where we are. So the fact that we are able to convey a coherent brand image, if you want to say it like that, of a touristic, a sustainable touristic destination where it's not just renewables sort of behind the, the socket, but it's also clean cars even when you're driving them or, or no cars even in some areas that's even even more sustainable uh, so the, the, the image the visibility of it is very important as well so being able to market specific destinations as sustainable destinations and that it becomes very apparent that they are sustainable when you visit them i think that's particularly important okay thank you i will i will come to ingmar now i have more questions for all of you and as i said you will have two or three from our audience i mean berlin berlin is also a very popular tourist destination. I'm not going to focus on that aspect of it. But of course, back to school, semi back to the workplace doesn't mean back to pollution, people jumping in cars. How, how do we avoid going from lockdown to gridlock? And how do we make some what sustainable mobility measures? I hope you'll, you'll tell us about some. How do we kind of make them more permanent? Yes, uh, I think it's a, a serious issue that during the lockdown or uh, easy lockdown or however you call it or shutdown uh, there was um, development away from public transport uh, at, in the first weeks it was reduced by 70 percent now we have almost two-thirds of pre-corona uh, occupation in buses and trams and trains so therefore uh, one of the key goals uh, is to improve hygiene standards or to keep the high hygiene standards so that people passengers feel safe uh, have uh, trust that they ha have high quality of transport uh, we are keeping up on the mask obligation so um, i think it's around 90 percent the the quota of people wearing a mask uh, against the uh, coronavirus this could be higher uh, but at least it's already 90%. Also part of uh, promoting um, the public transport by promoting these hygiene standards. Uh, we are doing that together with all public transport uh, institutions and companies within Germany. It's, it's a combined effort. 
And apart from that, we have realized that during the Corona times, people were keen on cycling or more and more people were, were keen on cycling, many newcomers. So elderly people, uh, more female newcomers than male newcomers on bicycles. And we were promoting new bicycle lanes. We had that in our plans anyway to promote or to build up to construct new bike lanes. Uh, there we chose a, a kind of rapid decree, rapid orders, so an, in an easy fashion that within a few days you could easily um, build up a new bike lane. And we had a 25% increase of cyclists in, in Berlin within weeks. And this is still keeping on. Um, yesterday we had a court decision which said, well, maybe we made a mistake in, uh, in these orders. We deny that, so we are uh, filing a complaint against this court decision. So we, let's see how, where that goes from. But uh, the issue is people want to cycle more even during or especially during Corona and we want to offer them the space and the bike lanes. Okay. Um, well, oh, yeah. Yes. No, 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 no that, that's the key yeah. key we'll activities we've, we've done from in terms of back to work or back to school. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I, I interrupted you there because I could sense that oh, also William wanted to, to, to come in but I just underscore that, that what you are saying echoes mm -hmm. very much what the Vice President Timmermans was saying in terms of there is a, mm. a want. People have, have seen something else. It's not like it wasn't there before. So it's an absolute waste not to jump on the back of that momentum and drive it forward. You had right. some things, I think, to say, William, from hearing these opening statements. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we've, we, we're talking about a, a green recovery, and I, you know, I, agree, I agree very much with all that has been said. And I think you know, th this panel is a, a really good reflection of, of what needs to happen. It's electromobility, it's clean cities, it's you know, a, a different economic model, a different tourism model. There's one thing I'd like to add, and that's, that's a reflection on jobs, because you know, we are obviously we're not doing this re green recovery package um, you know, just for the sake of it. This is a reaction to a major economic crisis. And I think you know, that, that's, that's why you know, we, T&E, together with the NGOs, we, we were super supportive of what Europe has been doing, the big rescue package. And I think it's a big opportunity for us to reshape um, our cities as, 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 you know, as, as they are doing in Berlin. But also, for example, if you look at the aviation sector, I think we need to ask ourselves the question, you know, after having spent 30 billion euros bailing out the airlines, do we want to go back to 2019? Do we want to have an aviation system where it is cheaper to fly from Brussels to Charleroi than it is to take the train? I think, for, you know, if that's what you want, do nothing. Uh, if you want a new, a new normal also in that sector, well, we've got, we got to change the operating systems. And I think that, that's true across the board in, in our cities, like if we do nothing, things are going to revert back to normal. So those pop-up cycling lanes, those low traffic zones in cities, this is extremely important. And that's what's going to allow us to, you know, to, to have a, a better new normal after the crisis. That's an important addition, I think. And in that, I mean, just to say, when you talk these pop-up zones, these, these, do you see, what role do you see for, um, the likes of me, you and me in that. You know, we, we, we've got big hitters here, we've got industry, we've got government, we've got EU, we've got member states, you know, cities. What, what do you expect me to be to take advantage of it? I, I think what the really remarkable thing about, about change is that, you know, we talk about the role of government, we talk about the role of, you know, institutional NGOs such as myself, but I think so many things that are changing our society are changing because courageous people are, are taking initiatives. People, you know, people are trying to reclaim their cities. People are, you know, people are basically occupying their streets and making sure their children can play on those streets. And I think a lot of, a lot of the change that is happening that politicians are talking about is the result of bottom-up grassroots pressure. And I think so there's, there's a lot that you and me can do in, in our neighborhoods, in our streets, and then of course in our jobs. Thank you. Tell me, I mean, how does that uh, uh, play that sort of bottom up grassroots? Because, of course, when I'm coming back to you, Emma, sorry, I probably wasn't very clear because, you know, batteries, I mean, batteries are everywhere. They're everywhere from lawnmowers to saunas to it's not we're not just talking cars. I think probably at the moment the perception is, is electromobility, but there's a big opportunity everywhere. Um, but we'll stick mainly with cars for now because I think what's important is that is to understand from you is that there is this fear that we might shift and, and you've, you've answered it mostly but 
um, that we're shifting from this dependence from oil in the Middle East to the battery cells from China. Um, and so there is there's quite a pressure on you as pioneers to deliver. But um, to meet this growing demand, can you talk about any sort of material shortages, some of the bigger issues at stake, what's coming at a premium to really make those low carbon batteries? Uh, I mean, this is going to be something where we are going to have to challenge ourselves within Europe. And uh, the European market is, a, is in an extremely comprehensive growth. And I think that uh, to answer your question, I think we will be, uh, in the beginning, we will have a, a dependency on, on China, as you mentioned. I think that it's very important for Europe to build our own supply chain. That, uh, as I mentioned before, with our industry tradition and the requirements we have, we are going to have to do it. Uh, there is a challenge also related to raw materials, and this is why I'm saying that we have to really plan it out uh, to do it right from the beginning, to make sure that we also, when we talk about the transparency and how we declare the product footprints, uh, which is, uh, of course, the battery cells, it's the systems, it's the EV cars as such, that we find a really good way to show the end consumer, so that's you and me, uh, what is the actual footprint of this car. Um, and, and, and we're just going to have to, as you said before, walk the talk, and we're just going to have to make sure that the, the anyone, any stakeholders that has a role in this supply chain uh, do enter Europe and do uh, play under the regulations of the European authorities, which is sometimes a bit demanding when it comes to the sort of the broad environmental footprint um, perspectives and, and, and make sure that we, we cover the entire range of raw material supply and of component supply uh, and, and, that we, and, and, and that we are a more complete fleet of, of factories supporting this new industry. Thank you. And I think important, and I won't park it on there now, but because William brought up this issue also of jobs, and this is very critical, and obviously I think that's something that would apply to you and, and to this factory, but I, I will we'll just leave it there for, for just a moment. Um, I, I will jump to Ingmar, and then I will come to you, Juan, and then at some point we will see what's coming in from um, the ladies and gentlemen of the audience. I caught there, Ingmar, that you were talking about uh, the promotion of hygiene standards, one of the ways of also getting people, because public transport has, has taken you know, such a hammering, the use, the use of public transport. So you were having there, you were talking about what you're doing with bike lanes, you were looking at the high quality of transport. Um, anything else you wanted to say specifically on what the city is doing to promote clean electromobility? Is there anything else that you... Yes, there is indeed. Um, I think it's on two pillars. One is the private uh, electro electric mobility and one is the uh, public transport electric mobility. So uh, we are having a program started and already in place uh, by um, converting the bus fleet, which is mostly diesel buses, to 100% uh, to electric uh, buses by 2030. We, we have now roughly 50, 60 uh, on the roads, and this will be 100 at the end of this year. And so year by year, by 2030, we will have all 1,600 buses, uh, electric, electric buses, uh, which also means uh, charging infrastructure for them and the second pillar is, of course, uh, in the private sector, so you and me and companies. Uh, we are heavily investing in charging infrastructure, um, still uh, a bit uh, in front of the, the, the wave of buying, of people buying electric cars. Uh, our role is to offer it in the public space because many, many cars are parked in public space in Berlin. There are not many. Uh, garages or, or private uh, parking spaces uh, behind the houses. Many people are parking their car just on the road be behind the light poles. And we are promoting also light pole uh, electric infrastructure, charging infrastructure. So th there's a lot we can do here. And um, uh, what we just one final remark, what we realize is that uh, they are not really economic for the um, companies building them up. 
Uh, so we are hoping that the percentage of electric cars will increase and increase. There is public support for that financially, uh, but so far uh, there's often just one, two or three cars a day at a charging station and that's not enough. Okay. But just staying with that theme before I come to Juan, um, I mean, and, and uh, all things electric, of course there was a big announcement today with T&E and Uber made this big announcement that Uber wants to go for 50% electric rides in Berlin uh, 2025. Any any thoughts on that? Well, this is uh, just something very positive. Uh, when companies uh, have such aims and ambitions, I hope the uh, general taxi drivers will uh, soon uh, adopt something similar. Uh, what, what we, of course, need is uh, an investment there. I hope Uber can can do that and the taxi drivers can do that. And what we also hope for is that the European recovery funds uh, will also give us, the cities of Europe, uh, some, some more financial support and perhaps also some, some legal framework where it's lacking uh, to support the charging infrastructure because there will be a full uh, change of, of uh, propulsion in, in cars and, and uh, lorries towards electricity and we have to face that uh, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, we're going to zoom out. I'm going to come to Joanne now and we're going to zoom out mm -hmm. from, from the city and look at, look at the wider area, come back to Spain if we, if we may, because uh, I didn't get a chance to, to hear from uh, Teresa Ribeiro about Spain's climate plan, but um, you, you know, you have many different social realities and geographies. There are specificities. That's not a word to say when you're drunk. There's very particular mobility challenges, you know, Ibiza, La Mancha. So um, does the Spanish government have a particular approach so that each region can move towards this clean, sustainable mobility that you yourself champion so highly? So uh, Spain is, is undergoing a, a huge transformation when it comes to sustainable mobility. And the very first thing we've done is adapt the uh, government structure to this this challenge. It sounds like a, a, a silly comment, but we used to have a, a, a ministry for infrastructure and public works, uh, which used to be, as the name says, very focused on uh, highways and motorways, on uh, high-speed rail, which is has its own uh, opportunities. Uh, but it wasn't very focused on, on mobility, uh, and part of it was the, the sort of mindset and the sort of mission in that ministry. Uh, for the last few months, we, this ministry has been transformed and it is now a ministry for mobility, for transport and for the urban agenda. And the idea is to invest less on hard mobility and more on, oh, sorry, on, on hard infrastructure and invest more in mobility solutions. So, for example, the traditional mindset would have been uh, if I have a rural, sparsely populated rural area, the best thing I can do is you know, take a motorway to it so you know, it's very accessible and, and businesses can have it. And, and that doesn't happen. That is a, emptying that area of population. What the people there need is accessibility, uh, they need access to mobility services, and that could mean on-demand services, you know, shuttle bus that you know, is there when, as and when they need it. Um, or when you would go to the cities, for example, or National Energy and Climate Plan, looks at every single municipality of more than 50,000 inhabitants in Spain, uh, having to have low emission zones, and walkable and cyclable areas in the city center, or going back to the islands, for example, taking advantage of the limited size of the island. Uh, there's no range anxiety with electric vehicles on, on islands because of, of the geographic uh, dimensions of the size of the islands. Uh, so as I said, very first thing is adapt the thinking and then adapt the solutions to the needs of each, uh, because obviously it's not the same to go in the main aspect to, to be in the middle of the city or to be in the Absolutely, to, cu to customize those solutions. It's not that you have to reinvent the wheel every time necessarily, but to really understand and localize what are the specific needs. And while I'm, and I'm so sorry, I think, I hope the audience doesn't have the issues. If I, again, I'm squinting further forwards in the hope I can hear you a little better. What I'm gonna do is I've got another question for you. I'd just like to stay with you. And then I'm going to see what has come in, uh, William, from our audience. And then I've got another couple of questions after Ingmar needs to leave us but I want to make sure if there's a question for him that we get that in of course I just want to touch base with you please sir about aviation because it's come up several times we've talked tourism uh, it's one of the fastest growing sources of CO2 emissions we haven't seen much in terms of green conditionality for airline bailouts it's not not really happening so um, 
Any other measures you think that, that, that need to be pushed, that you see, that you feel enthusiastic or that need to be there to clean up aviation? It's, as you can imagine, an extremely sensitive uh, subject for a country which has uh, you know, two areas, two island areas and two enclaves outside the mainland. And therefore, a lot of our the internal mobility in these areas is based on, on, on aviation and a lot of tourism, obviously, as a, as a country big on tourism. Aviation is very, very important. So, bearing in mind you know, the, the social and the job implications of that, um, you know, one of the key aspects of the energy transition overall and zooming out slightly uh, is to ensure that you know, tax and subsidy and economic signals are coherent with, with your wider policy. Uh, and that means looking at existing subsidies for fossil fuels, uh, all of them, uh, and that includes the exemption on taxation on kerosene and you know, other fuels. So we need to make sure that every single economic sector and every single single fuel consuming sector pays their fair share, pays their fair part. But also we need to be aware of what the starting point is. And therefore, any transition needs to be very sensitive to the reality, but also the particular moment. Of that. We've seen an absolute uh, reduction in uh, the tourism sector this summer, obviously because of the COVID crisis, uh, and we cannot transform the economy from one day to the other. But at the same time, you cannot play the ostrich and you know hide your your head under the ground. So we need to be aware of this, we need to be aware that you know, tourists will be uh, less willing, in the same way as we said before, tourists want to reduce their carbon footprint, tourists are looking for sustainability. We need to factor aviation into it. So maybe start changing the touristic model, look at fewer but longer holidays where people come and stay longer with us, um, but come and go less often, that sort of thing, as well as how do we move in terms of biofuels or synthetic fuels in aviation. So we need to look at the whole picture. We also need to be sensitive to the social and the economic situation, uh, but we cannot avoid. You know, it will, aviation will end up being the, the elephant in the room and ability yeah. and, and we need to start addressing that from, from the from Okay, well, I can tell you, elephant in the room or not, there's been a few questions that have come in on aviation. I haven't quite finished with you guys, but I just want to make sure I can pose some of these. William, I might save some of these till the end. Let's see, because there's quite a few for you, but chip in and then perhaps if you keep it short, we can come back to them when, when, when our panel is, is finished. But um, for you and also for Ingmar, there just, there was more questions about cycling infrastructures. You know, you talked about that, Ingmar. Anything else you want to add? Because people are saying, well, how can this be prioritized? How can we build on, on, on um, the, what, what we saw during COVID. I mean, there's already changes in Brussels mm. here. So how can we build on that and prioritize that cycling infrastructure? Yeah, um, f firstly, it needs a political aim or vision to promote that. And, and uh, it's also important to listen to NGOs uh, such as TNE or cycling NGOs. They've got good proposals, they've got experience. We have the, the German uh, Federal Cycling Club and our Changing Cities, another NGO, which are supporting uh, the general line. Of course, they're criticizing us as government that they should do, but still uh, they are very helpful in the discussion. And then it's important to shift funds and, and to install personnel and the, the funds you need. Uh, of course, cycling infrastructure is much cheaper than car or road infrastructure or public transport. So therefore it's, it's an easy gain. And uh, finally, um, you, you have to design this cycling infrastructure, which is uh, good for people. So people want security, so they need space, which means uh, a, a width of two meters at least, so that you can overtake other cyclists. And uh, if there is a heavy road, uh, you should look at a kind of protection, uh, if, it's like, if it's kind of poles or smaller things, or uh, white uh, marks uh, on, on the roads. Uh, there's many things you can think about, uh, but of course you need this kind of differentiation. Otherwise people won't like to cycle and that's important. They, they have to feel safe and they have to uh, have a good tarmac so, so that it's easy to ride. So th these are just a few elements and that's what we are working on in this coalition here in Berlin. And of course, uh, you need a regulatory framework um, and uh, the, the, the funds essential for that. Okay, thank you. I personally think that uh, cyclists, car drivers and public transport drivers need to have a big love-in so that when that infrastructure is there, 
we're all civil to each other when we use it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm jesting, but I think you understand where I'm coming mm. from. What do you want to add to that, William? I mean, uh, promoting cycling, I, I don't think there's a, there's a secret to this. I think we've seen how, how it works in, in Copenhagen. We've seen how it works in Amsterdam. It, it's, you know, it can be done. And I think a lot of, a lot of this is about making it easier for, for, for people. Well, it's about speed, essentially. You know, if you, can get, if you can get to a place faster by bike and you can do that in a safe way, I think a lot of people are going to are going to choose the bike over over the car. So it's it's about changing your infrastructure, and generally that that's that's hard because you're competing with you know with motorists, you're competing with buses, and there I think the you know the current situation, the post-COVID situation, is a big opportunity because you know that competition for space. We've got a bit less of that because a lot of people are teleworking, a lot of people are at home. So there's a bit of free road space for the first time in such a long time. So. I think you know the, the moment has come to you know take some of that space and give it back to cyclists and, and turn our cities into you know much more livable places. Thank you. I'm going to crack right on, and I'm going to come to Joanne, and then I'm going to come to um, Emma for a question on actually um, the battery package coming up. If you might want to, to comment in October, which I didn't didn't raise with uh, with Franz Timmermans, but I do want to. Uh, there are a lot of people, uh, Joanne, who travel on night trains. A lot of people in our audience who are, I mean, I can understand that. It's very romantic um, and efficient. Uh, what does the EU do for the advancement of transnational night trains? It was a question for you, actually, and for you, William. Would you like to uh, come in there, Joanne? Um, so, I mean, definitely defending uh, night trains and transnational uh, rail transport in some of the big investments in the last decade have been, in the last two decades, have been to do especially with high-speed rail, which isn't necessarily compatible with, uh, with night um, with, with, with night rail transport. But if we are going to move away from aviation and we need a sustainable alternative and night trains and transnational uh, rail transport is, is in the realm there. So we're starting to look with nationally in our case, see which alternatives there are within the Spanish mainland, and which you know, destinations there are that we could move without uh, flight, without the need to fly. Uh, but definitely we need to continue to look at the uh, transport in the EU and see how we can depend less on, on aviation. And what's the complexity there? I mean, in boosting that, because just even the words transnational, because that's 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 where we get to the nub of it in terms of coherence, in terms of crossing borders. Look, uh, complexity in the European rail system, are, uh, they, they go together very well. Um, I've, you know, I've worked a bit on rail myself in, in the past. And uh, you know, I think there's, there's, the thing is there's not one silver bullet to making the European rail system you know, much, much better. There's a lot of things that need to be done. So one, it's about funding. So you know, if we want more international, transnational connections. Maybe we need to encourage member states to do that. Maybe we need to use part of the European money to encourage those transnational connections. We can also do that for night trains. I think it's also about market barriers. Uh, the railway system is too much, it's too national. It's still too national and we make, need to make it easier for new operators to operate on, 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 on different national systems. And I think it's also about political will. We've seen new night trains coming up, you know, we've seen new night trains from, from Vienna to Brussels, from Stockholm to, to Central Europe. And, you know, basically this is about ministers and, and, and their administrations coming to the conclusion that there's popular demand for this. So maybe one of the things that Franz Timmermans and the transport commissioner needs to do is bring all those transport commissioners to Europe uh, or, or do a video conference and, and, and talk about how we're going to have more night trains. But, you know, there's this is this is important and we we can do so much better but I, I also want to be i want to be honest about this or we need to be honest about this we will not be able to shift all aviation travel to rail travel that's not going to be possible you know either we're going to travel a lot less and there's going to be a lot less people going to spain on holidays or we're going to have to make aviation clean so that is at least as important Oh God, if we travel a lot less, does that mean we have even more Zoom meetings than we already do? That would be slightly hellish, would it not? Indeed, but that wouldn't be a bad thing. Okay, oof. Okay, so Ingmar, can you stay with us just for five minutes? Because I don't want to leave. Emma's been just very patient, and then I have a question for all of you. So if that's okay, because um, that's okay. You know, there is yeah. an interest, obviously, in hearing from you, your opinion on this, the Commission coming forward with a sustainable battery law in October, um, first globally, but what you'd like... Anything else you'd like to add on that to see to help the green battery industry thrive? 
Well, I think the, the oh, most I'm important thing is... Oh. oh, sorry. sorry. No, do you know what? I wasn't clear. I misunderstood I said, you. Could no. you kindly stay with us just while I come back to Emma? Because I thought I was going to lose yes. you. Emma, what's your, what, what are you hoping for when this come, comes about in October? Yeah, well, there are really four things that come to my mind when, you, when I was asked this question. And I think that the first thing is that we really have a good transparency on carbon footprint. All batteries placed on the market within Europe should be fully declared for, for carbon footprint. Second thing is to really encourage and, and create incentives for direct speed of renewable energy into all the factories that are built. And, and all the production units within the supply chain of, of this new industry that is being built in Europe. We can only do it once and let's do it right. And the, the, the third thing that I really want to push for is to set really ambitious goals for recycling. And, and this, this feeds back to the raw material discussion and, and making sure that we are really using all the materials that we want imported to Europe, making sure that it's not leaving Europe uh, and, and getting us away from the uh, dependence uh, on China uh, when it comes to the raw material fee, but also recycling uh, in the end could, if we are not saying this right, end up uh, in Asia somewhere. And then the last thing, of, of course, is a full declaration of the raw material uh, fee and making sure that we are uh, sourcing ethically, of course, uh, but, but also sustainably and that, that we are looking for the future generations in in how we build the supply chain. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to keep keep my eye on the time, William, because I think that, that audiences have a have a general time when they need to, you know, there's, you all know, there's only so long that you can hold. Uh, and so we've, we, we've done a good 90 minutes, but before you leave me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure there's a wealth of things that you didn't get a chance to say specifically in this context of, you know, the green recovery for transport. So in any of your stories, in, from any of your expertise or your planning or your strategy going forward, a last word from each of you, Ingmar, what did any of you not get to say? to me and to well, us well there's there's maybe on just one aspect uh um, or two i would say the, the new recovery funds or whatever they are calling it uh, have to be clearly based on sustainability and which also means uh, supporting financially supporting the means of sustainable transport, which is trains and electrical mode of transport and cycling infrastructure. Uh, we Maybe there's a chance for trans-European networks of night trains, which is a small element of train, train travel, but anyway. And the second and last remark I would like to make is, uh, it would all be easier with the carbon dioxide energy tax in Europe. Uh, we have been working for that, I think, for 30 years, and, and always there's one or two countries who, kind of stop that project and uh, it would be so easy if a few countries would start their own project and I think the others will follow and this would make it much easier and faster, the transformation. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you so very much. I, if you can stay with us till the end, we're closing in seven minutes. If you can't, I understand that you have a prior engagement, then thank you so very much for joining us and, and for your very comprehensive answers to my questions. Um, Joanne, I come to you. Either I can say, you know, you can have an ask to the Commission, you know, how does, how does the Commission help Spain speed up the electrification of transport? Is there an ask there? Are there specifics? Or do you want to speak about something else entirely that you didn't get a chance to put on the table? In fact, it's, it's one, of, one of the same thing. The, the one thing I wanted to put on the table is, is actually an ask uh, to the Commission, but also to European level debate, such as TME as a as a European level uh, NGO, you know, besides funding, besides legislation, which are all very important things that we need to do at you know, local, national, international level, uh, something that, that I think is absolutely important for sustainable uh, transport in particular is a common vision, a common vision and common signals and a common, uh, it's a common strategy for consumers, for companies, uh, for service providers. Only if we are all aware of what the, what the target is, and where we want to walk towards, can we have sensible debates on how to go about it. If we aren't able to, to collectively imagine, you know, this, what does a sustainable transport look like? What does a carbon neutral economy and therefore carbon neutral mobility look like? Uh, then we're not going to be able to design the right products, design the right technologies, 
to design the right, the right policies and make the right investments. So the ask to the Commission is, let's not make, you know, let's not let the, the emergency, the short-term emergency of the COVID recovery, let, let, don't let that you never forget, make us forget the longer term carbon neutrality uh, target that we've committed to at the European level. And so let's make sure, you know, just as Ingmar was saying, that the investments and the decisions we make now are coherent or consistent with that commitment. So that would be my, my ask and my closing message. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. If you don't keep the vision there, you don't keep people driving forward. And of course, the, the trickiest thing isn't just the vision, it's actually people being bothered to deliver it. But uh, that's the challenge. But just having it there in the first place and that it's coherent at all levels with, as I said, the kind of momentum we see now is, 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 is what you're saying is hugely important. Let's, let's, let's not just focus on the short term. And Emma, for you, very briefly, a last um, something you didn't get to say, to share? I just want to send from North Pole to Europe that let's not create an A team and a B team here. Let's make sure that sustainability will become the differentiator for the entire European uh, EV, uh, raw material, battery manufacturing uh, supply chain. And let's make sure that we are now driving this together to make, to, to really have a sustainable battery fleet within Europe. Uh, and that we do this together as a team. There will be market for everyone. Uh, we just have to do it right. And we just have to acknowledge that it's not going to be easy. Uh, but we're just going to have to uh, jump into the game and really walk the talk here. Well, and not easy, but also as we're going back to Timmermans, he didn't use that word, I uh, can't remember what it was now, but a moral imperative for who is coming after us. So. Absolutely. So I thank you all very much. I'm going to leave you now. I know it's very exhausting to have to stay online. I think we're all aware of that. So I greatly appreciate uh, that you have been so diligent and uh, so respectful of your colleagues as they shared their expertise and their ideas with us. Anything else you would like to say to these good people before I release them and I close with you? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's, 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 been, it's been great having you and I, I look forward to, to working with you to, yeah, to make this this transition happened. So thanks. Thank you. You are released, good people. And I'm going to turn now, ladies and gentlemen. We did have a couple more questions, but you'd need to give very short answers to them, William, because you were actually also part of that ask. Um, and, and perhaps I can ask that before I ask you to round up. But it, it might be that you were going to add these anyway. So why don't I put okay. them out there and you say, Kat, I've exhausted that. I can't be bothered. Um, particularly <clears throat> about the emissions targets for uh, 2030 um, will shift under the Green Deal. Do you, if you look in your crystal ball, what level do you see them shift to? So this, this is a question about how, how ambitious our CO2 standards yep. should be. Look, we're, uh, we're preparing a big report on that. So I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say anything before that, say anything, you know, give anything away. But the point is that if we want to decarbonize our transport system, we need to move to 100% zero emission vehicles by 2035, new vehicle sales by 2035. We currently have a target, a European target, that's going to get us to 30, you know, a bit of luck, 40% EVs in 2030. So, you know, going from 30, 40 to 100% in five years' time, that's obviously not going to work. So we need to see a pretty significant increase in ambition in 2030. I think you know, what the exact number will be, you will read in the report, but it's, it's going to be more, more than half, more than half. So that, that's, that's the level of ambition we're looking at. And I think it's, you know, I, I could tell you 100% in 2030, but that's, that's not how we work. So, you know, we want an increase in ambition. It needs to be realistic and it needs to be you know, in line with our, you know, with our longer term climate goals. And I think, uh, we, I think there was some um, talk, especially, I mean, I feel that we talked a lot about aviation and we were very clear about, you know, bringing them all in to the, this climate ambition in a way that they hadn't been pushed to before. But I think people also recognise, not least with job losses, that the, the sector is in a deep crisis. So how, any, any last thoughts on how you strike that balance between assisting the sector but also pushing them to innovate? on that footprint? I, I think that's an excellent question. I think that's, that's to be honest, that's going to be the, the challenge that we face in the next years. We, we want to, you know, impose a number of, of, of new rules on the aviation system. And at the same time, they are facing a very hard time. They're going to be laying off people. They're already laying off people. But I think we don't, we don't 
we don't have a choice because the system needs to change. The system that we had early 2020 is completely unsustainable. The growth levels, you know, the new airports, all of this is, this is completely unsustainable. So I think let's use this opportunity. Let's use the fact that airlines are now beholden to the public because we have given them more than 30 billion euros in taxpayer money. And let's use it as, as an opportunity to change those operating conditions, meaning let's introduce a kerosene tax, let's you know, let's strengthen the ETS and let's start mandating those e-fuels. Not today, right? Not whilst they're actually not flying, but once they're up and running again, once they're at, you know, a certain threshold of their pre-crisis level, these, these, you know, these measures need to kick in and that gives them time to prepare. And, you know, I think there's, there's no choice. It, it needs to change. So... I think we've reached the end, almost. I think we need to let these good ladies and gentlemen at home go and have their dinner very soon, or drinks, that will certainly be me. Um, there's been so much said. This, you know, there's a lot of content in this hour and what will be, I think, hour and 45 minutes in the end. Um, anything where you think, you know, oh, going ahead, yeah, for me, that's the biggest pain point. That's where, you know, we need some rigor, some compromise. We had the word compromise earlier. And then, um, to end on a high note, because we're celebrating your personal 30th birthday, William, uh, what you feel most heartened about? I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether after, after today I've, 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 identif I've identified issues where we, where we need to compromise. I think, you know, I think I'm actually heartened by, by what Mr. Timmermans has told us. I'm heartened by what the panel told us. I'm, it's a real shame that we didn't hear more from Ribera, but I'm sure I, I would have been heartened by that as well. It's a, it's a difficult time, you know, where it's a, it's a big economic crisis, it's a big, you know, it, it's a difficult moment for all of us. But I think every crisis is an opportunity and I think we've got a, you know, as the Vice President said, we've got a, a once in a generation opportunity to completely change, you know, the, the way our economy runs, the way our society works. And I am actually personally, you know, even more hopeful after today that, that we're going to be successful. So yeah, thanks everybody for joining. And the last thing I'd say is that I'm, I'm very proud of the organization I lead and I'm very proud of the group of people that we've pulled together and um, thank you so much to you as well. So, thank you, thank thanks. you very much. And I was going to, and I, it would be egging over egging the pudding to say what defines t and &E. I think you will, I think it's clear what defines t and &E. I think you are one of those people clearly who, who defines t and &E, and I hope that that, that carries through to a very successful next decade and a next 30 years ahead. And I'll be here, I'll be, what, more than 80 if you ask me back to moderate for in 30 years' time. That's really quite hideous, isn't it? So I'm Eat. still the CEO, will uh, invite yeah. you. All right, lovely. I'll be coming now. I'll be coming up the stairs. So thank you. Thank you so much to you. I thank all of our guests for joining the party this evening. I thank the very, very hard working, and there are quite a lot of people working behind the scenes, uh, T&E, for hosting the party, and, of course, the lovely technicians who've helped things to run smoothly so the technicians from INS helping things roll from a technical point of view and of course ladies and gentlemen we thank all of you for gate crashing this party and for sticking with us if you enjoyed what you watched of course you need to tweet that's a given I do wish you all due rigor uh, passion and commitment in supporting the green recovery for transport and of course the European Green Deal as a whole to achieve Europe's ambition of being the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Not a small feat, but I wish you a very good evening. Thank you very much.